Hi, I'm Lynn Hardy, and this is The Living Word. According to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, it says, You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and the enduring word of God. So our Lord came. We call Jesus Lord, and he came so that we could have life. We could have it in abundance. Give me just a moment, please. Theo, what are you doing? Come on, baby. Okay, let's try that again. <laughs> so welcome today to this episode of The Living Word. I'm Lynn Hardy, and I'm here today with a message from you, from our Lord, who is the Living Word. According to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, it says, You have been born again not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. This is the Where is Jesus series, the sixth episode. And today we're going to talk about Smyrna, the church of Smyrna, and the second death. Most of... Oh my gosh, Lord, help me. Lord, quiet the dog, please. Theo, maybe this is not the message I meant to give today. Let's see, Lord, quiet the dog so I can give this message. If not, apparently I've got something wrong. But let's continue. So our Lord came, and it, we all know that he came so we could have life and life in abundance. But so many of us are not satisfied. So many of us are asking, where is Jesus in my life? We know that a wrong focus can lead us away from God and make it hard for us to connect to Jesus. If we're not feeling him in our life, if we're not connecting with him, it could be because we have a wrong focus. God has revealed a few things about that wrong focus earlier in the series. And now today he's revealing that there are five churches that he spoke about in a prophecy in the, Revela in the book of Revelation. And there's five churches that have a wrong focus and two that had a right focus. By examining these churches, we can examine our life and see if our focus is wrong because we're being taught wrong in the church where we are. So we're going to continue looking at the churches today. And today I have the great joy of talking to you about a church that had the right focus for God. Before I begin, It is very unusual for my little dog to bark. He hasn't barked in a few weeks. He's been very calm and very quiet. And that's very abnormal. So I'm wondering if the Lord isn't telling me that perhaps this is not the right topic for today. So let's begin again. Hi, I'm Lynn Hardy, and this is The Living Word. We know that according to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, that we have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. That Jesus is the Word. And that we have access to Him. He is our Lord, and he is our God. Now, we are continuing in a series called, Where is Jesus? Because so many today feel like they cannot connect with God or with the Lord. They're wondering, where is Jesus in their life? That our Lord stated that he came so he could have life in abundance, but why are we not satisfied? And sometimes a wrong focus can lead us away from God 
and make it hard to connect with our Lord. So I think the Lord is telling me that I need to continue with the five churches in Revelation that show a wrong focus. I was going to give you a church that had the right focus today, but perhaps he wants to wait till the end. So today, we're going to skip down to something I had prepared for next week. And this is for the church at Pergamos. That's where we're going to go today. This is Revelation 2, verse 12. Here's what God says to churches that are like Pergamos. Oh, I see why like now, Lord. Thank you for that. He said that there was something important to learn about this church before we go any forward with anything else. So forgive me for the complications of the day. It seems the Lord was telling me that I had these in the wrong order and I was not listening. Um, so let's look at the church in Pergamos. Revelation 2, verse 12. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things said he, which has the sharp two-edged sword. Now, we know, according to scripture, that the sharp double-edged sword is the word of God. And when God opens um, and greets a church, he's, re he's showing them something that they need to hold to, that they need to remember because of what they're going through. This church has forgotten to hold fast to the word of God. So what is this church doing? Let's look how they're not applying the word of God. Revelation 2, 13, the American King James Version. I know your works and where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is, and you hold fast to my name and have not denied my faith, even in the days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you, where Satan dwells. Oh, look at this. Okay, this church seems to be doing everything right. It's like, okay, they hold fast to the name of Jesus. That is great. It says that, that they hold fast to the name of Jesus. And then they have this word, this Greek word, thronos, that means seat of power. So even where Satan dwells, they're holding fast to the name of Jesus. We know that if it's saying Satan dwells in a certain spot, that means that the enemy has a place of power in a specific location. It's Satan's seat of power upon this earth. So this church is where Satan's seat of power is. Now, if we look at this scripture, we can see where that's located. Antipas was martyred when Rome was in power throughout the world. Antipas is a saint in the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. Remember, it's the Pope who, who governs from Rome. And we know that there will be a one world church that the Antichrist wants everyone to be part of during the last age, during the tribulation, where horrible things are going to be happening. So Christians in the part of the world where there is this mighty move to make all churches one, even those churches who do not acknowledge our God. When that happens, when that continues to happen, that is Satan's seat of power. This could be addressed to the churches that claim to honor St. Antipas because it specifically mem mentions him in addressing this church. So let's look a little more about Antipas. Antipas died just after 68 AD. John was the author of Revelation. And according to the majority of biblical scholars, they say that he probably died somewhere around 92 AD. John lived a long time, right? He lived a very long time. So this confirms that the book of Revelation was written late in John's life, most likely after the year 70 AD, because he mentions the death of Antipas, who died in 68 AD. Jerusalem was also destroyed in 70 AD. So all the references in the book of Revelation that refer to the temple being destroyed 
cannot possibly be referring to the destruction of the temple that happened in 70 AD. This must be a future temple. When it talks about these things being done in the temple, it must be a future one because the temple was already destroyed when it talks about all this stuff being done in the temple of God. This is how we know that the book of Revelation and the tribulation will begin when we see a temple of God created in Jerusalem. Only then can all of these things come to pass. So this mention of Antipas, even though it seems minor, is critical to understanding that it addresses his death. He died in 68 AD. The, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. This means that John is writing about a temple that will come again, a new temple that will be created. And this is what all of the scriptures are referring to. Now. If you are in a Pergamus church and you're holding fast to the name of Jesus, you know you have not denied his name, you have not de denied your faith in him, and you're in a place where the Antichrist is going to be moving powerfully, what else can you expect to happen? It says here, I have a few things against you because you have them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat the things sacrificed to idols, and, and to commit fornication. Okay, so here is what they've forgotten according to the word of God. The word of God is always true. His ways are always his, his ways. And so this church who's holding fast, who has faith in Jesus, they're forgetting these things. Now, a doctrine, if you're new to the Christian faith, a doctrine means a accepted teaching within the church. It's the guidelines of the church. Now, Balaam was a diviner, somebody who could contact the spiritual realm. And when Israel came into a nation, they, they numbered in the millions. So imagine this, a million people entering your nation, and the king sought out the sorcerer to, to curse them. But, but Balaam found out that God was greater. He could not curse the Israelites. Instead, Balaam told Balak that if you will send in your beautiful women, they will fall into sin and God will no longer be with them. And so Balaam taught Balak, the king, to lead Israel astray into sin. And then they would have other idols in their camp and then the king could defeat them. So this is what this church is guilty of. According to Romans, it says, that God, when we refuse to acknowledge God and learn his ways, when we know of God, when we've heard of God, and we refuse to follow him, we refuse to learn and apply his ways, he gives us over to um, lust of the same sex, men for men and women for women. Did you know that's a curse? That is actually a curse from God trying to correct his people because they're refusing to acknowledge him. And yet, in our society, we, there's many parts of this society that celebrate this sin. There's even a church that is, well, okay, I'm just going to say it. The Pope has announced that the Catholic Church will allow same-sex marriages and will support them. That is what it's talking about here, is that, that you are leading people into sexual sin, which is homosexuality. That is not God's way. Now, I'm not saying we should look down upon them and cast stones at them because people who have the desire for the same sex, they're actually taking the punishment of the world upon themselves. They're in that state because, because the world turned their back on God. So if anything, you know, no sin is greater than another. Um, if you are living out with someone outside of marriage, it's the, it's the same sexual sin. If you are um, lying and, and lying to people on a regular basis and manipulating people, this is a sin. So all sins are equal, but we can't embrace it. That is not God's way. And that is what this church is guilty of. Fornication, committing adultery. And teaching the children of Israel, God's children, to do the same. They're saying it's okay to do these things. 
Now it also talks about eating things sacrificed to idols. This is another point towards pointing towards a Catholic type church. Because when we, how many of you know that um, there, when you make an offering towards anyone or pray to anyone that is not God, that it becomes an idol. We should not be praying to saints. We should not be praying to anything but our God. We have access to God. We have Jesus as our Lord. Who is more powerful than him? Who do we need besides him? So these things are wrong. Now, there is some additional things we can see about this church that has a wrong focus. Uh, Revelation 2.15. So you also have them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which, which thing I hate. The Nicolaitans, they use the message of grace through the sacrifice of Jesus to say we don't need to worry about sin anymore. An example of this is if somebody tells you, all you have to do is say five Hail Marys and you're fine if you sin. All you have to do is come and say you're sorry and a sin and you'll be forgiven. Nope, that is not what God's word says. If you don't know this, please go and learn at the free online classes at the online Christian church. Because we should be encouraging people to follow the narrow path the Lord has. Wide is the path that leads to destruction. Narrow is the path that leads to God and eternal life. We can't encourage them to follow sin. There is a hyper grace message that would also qualify as a Nicolaitans um, doctrine. And that is, the, that is the one that says, oh, we have Jesus as our Lord and our Lamb. He was sacrifice for our sin. And so all our sin is taken care of. We don't have to worry about sin. You know, once you say the prayer and take Jesus as your Lord, you're automatically guaranteed for heaven and there's nothing you can do to prevent that. Well, that is not what the word of God says. You cannot simply tell God you're sorry about your sin. You have to confess it. When we look up the word confess, when it says confess your sins and they shall be forgiven, that word means to see it the way God does. It's not about talking about it. It's seeing it the way God does. And, and if we see it the way God does, we're going to want to stop doing it. So if you are in, in a church that doesn't expect you to stop and turn from sin, but says, ah, oh, we're all human. We can't help it. We're just, you know, it happens. Don't worry about it. Well, that is not what God's word says. I hate to break it to you. That is not what he, what it says. Go and look at the free classes online in about removing attacks. Um, attacks come because we have an open door um, to the enemy. Now, I'm not saying that sin keeps you from heaven. But it says that it continued, repetitive, per, uh, purposeful sin, intentionally sinning over and over again, will eventually nullify your salvation. We do our best. And yes, sin happens. We must see it the way God does and try not to do it anymore. Confess it to him and work at it. Work at learning his ways. And we can help you with that. Okay, so let's continue on. What is necessary for this type of church? If you're in a church with either of those two things, a church that says that homosexual marriage is okay, a church that says we don't have to worry about committing sin. We can go out, we can curse, we can say the F-bomb, we can go drink and get drunk, and it doesn't matter because Jesus paid for all our sin. If you have, you're in either one of those types of churches, what is necessary? How do you get clean? How do you get make your way back to God? How do you um, find Jesus once more? Revelation 2, 16 through 17. Oh, it begins with that word. That scary, scary word. It says, repent, repent, or else I will come to you quickly. I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. That's that two-edged sword. And he that, let it, that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat the hidden manna and will give him a white stone. And in the stone, a new name is written, which no man knows that saving he that receives it. So let's talk about repenting. 
some people think that that's a four letter word instead of a six letter word. Repenting just means to turn around and go the other way. Stop doing it. So there's doctrines that are wrong. And if you're following them, it can mean big trouble. And what is the reward for for turning from these things and, and not coming into agreement with them anymore? It says that you will have hidden manna to eat. What is hidden manna? Manna was the miraculous provision of God for his people as they went through the great uh, trial in the desert. So when when Israel was freed from Egypt, then they were led through the desert for 40 years and provided for miraculously by God. The desert was not a hospitable place. It was a time of hardship for Israel where where God would provide for them and guide them, right? Does this say anything about not coming to the, um, being freed from the wrath that's on the earth? Does this say anything about not being in a time of trouble that's upon the whole earth? No. It says, oh, God will provide for you during that time. That means that, yes, there is a church and a lot of them that will miss what we call the rapture. And that will be here when the Lord comes or when when the Antichrist raises to power and when the Lord comes. So the let's talk about the other reward, the white stone. Now, this is also really important, okay, because you have a the other the second reward is you get a white stone with a new name on it. What does that mean? Hmm. Okay, a white stone. In ancient times, in in Roman times, when this was written, it was given to victors of a race in ancient Rome. The stone would get them into a private banquet of guests of privilege, a, a place of privilege, and they could be a guest there. This means that this church will not be part of the bride of Christ. They will be at the wedding, at the wedding feast. They'll get to go to the big banquet. Have you ever wondered in the book of Revelation, where the wedding guests come from. Because Jesus talks about it. He, it says um, in one of his parables that go out and invite all these guests, wherever you can find them, invite them to the wedding. So where are those wedding guests coming from? This is that. This, these are those that will be the wedding guests. They have a special entry into the kingdom of heaven. They get a new name to enter into heaven with and to get to be a wedding guest. What does that mean if you don't turn from the sin? You don't get the new name? Where is your life? You know, um, your eternal life. Do you make it into heaven? If you're, if it, I don't know. I can't answer that question. It doesn't say that you won't make it into heaven, but it also might mean you might miss, miss the wedding, even as a guest. So there's, there's some room here, some room for, hmm, what does God mean? So this is the message that the Lord has for you today. So for those of you who would like more information about the book of Revelation, once a month I hold a meeting where you can come and ask questions. And if any of these things that I've said here today you're wondering about, oh, why did she say that about about the book of Revelation? Why did she say that about the tribulation? You can come to that meeting. The important thing that the Lord, the reason why the Lord said he wanted me to do this church first is about Antipas. Antipas is the key. John wrote this, and it's hotly debated about when he wrote it. And he talks about sacrifices and offerings being made in a temple, and that that's part of the end time tribulation that everybody's waiting for, the tribulation and the great tribulation. But here we see John is talking about Antipas, and he's uh, who died in 68 A.D., that was two short years before the church was most likely destroyed, the, the temple in Jerusalem. And we know that John lived until 92 AD. So that means that Re- the book of Revelation was written and dispatched after the destruction of the temple. That there will be a new temple built 
when you see that temple going up, and it will happen within the lifetime of most of those online, when you see that church or the new temple in Jerusalem, Jerusalem being built to, to God, know that that is the beginning of what most refer to as the tribulation, but is Daniel's week, that seven-year period that is talked about. And these churches, all of the churches in Revelation will exist at that time. I hope that helps. You understand why the book of Revelation is for today. Why the tribulation is yet to come. And how important it is for you to know where Jesus is. For you to have him in your life. During the great trouble that is coming upon the whole earth, it is the Lord who will save you. It is the Lord who will provide for you. Connecting with him is so important. That is the job of the online Christian church, is to teach you how to connect with the Lord. So you don't have to ask, where is Jesus? You feel him in your life. You can hear from him. You can be guided for by him. And during this time, you will know what to do. He is the answer. Not prepping and saving stuff, although that's not a bad idea. But our focus has to be on our Lord, connecting with him. And we see that this church is under correction by God because they allowed sexual sin, worshiping of idols, and also hypergrace. Sin doesn't matter. And it does. That our Lord, our Lord has set us free from sin. When you take Jesus as your Lord, he's given you all the tools. He's given you his blood. And if you know how to apply it rightly, if you know how to receive him rightly, you can be freed from the overwhelming desire to sin. You can be freed from the attacks of the enemy that come because of sin. Come and learn how at the online Christian church. That is all I have for today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I just thank you. I thank you for all that you've done. I thank you for your faithful servant, John, the disciple whom you loved. The disciple who gave forth a prophecy. The prophecy is the book of Revelation. I thank you that it shows us your desire for your churches throughout all time. They were existed then and they exist now. Lord, I pray for each person who will listen to this message, who is listening now or, or will listen later. Lord, open their eyes to see, open their hearts to know what church they're connected to and whether or not they want to remain there or find one of the other churches to be a part of. Let them know, Lord. Let them know what church they're involved with. Most importantly, Lord, let them know you. Show them, Lord, how to connect with you more. We thank you for your spirit. Holy Spirit, show them how to he hear your voice, the difference between your voice and any other. I place each, each one, Lord, into your hands until I see you again. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, I ask these things. Amen. Hi, I want to welcome everyone here today to this episode of The Living Word. You know, our Lord is the Word, and He is God, and He lived among us. In 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 23, in American King James Version, it says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. Today, I am bringing you an extra 
special message. This is one from the Lord who let me know uh, why we had so many technical difficulties on the last meeting. This is an update concerning last week's meeting on Pergamum, the Church of Pergamum. If you recall, last week I had a horrible time getting started. When we first started, my um, microphone wouldn't connect and no one could hear me. And then the next time I started, every time I started to speak, my dog started barking. It only happened when I spoke. And this was very interesting because recently my dog has lost its sight and he he can barely see he can see shadows sometimes he seems better sees better than others but as a consequence he doesn't bark so he never barks because he can't see anything to bark at so it was very interesting that he only barked when i started talking on the program so i took a moment to pray and i released to the lord in my head if if he was not going to keep the dog silent i would understand that there would uh was something amiss by the um and when he barked again i said okay lord it seems this is not the right message for today and the holy spirit brought to me it was the church of pergamum that i needed to talk about the pergamum pergamus church and there was more to say and i held back and for that i'm sorry i have promised you that here at the living word i would bring you the meat the fullness of what God was saying. I would give you messages from the Lord, but I didn't tell you all of what he said. I was concerned that many of you might not like it. I will not make that mistake again. From now on, I will do as my Lord asks. So this is the message the Lord has sent for you. What I didn't add to it is this. Do you know last week when God insisted I give the message about the Pergamus church, right? It, the, my dog would not stop barking until I started talking about this church. That that was on Valentine's Day. That was February 14th. Do you know why we celebrate Valentine's Day? This is the message the Lord told me to give to you, which I was like, oh, no, I don't want to talk about that. Okay, Valentine's Day is actually Saint Valentine's Day. It is celebrating a martyr in the Catholic Church. He died on February 14th. There are actually several saints with that name. So when you celebrate Valentine's Day, you are coming into agreement with the Pergamus Church. You see, this causes a wrong focus. Let's look at John 4, 7 and 8. Most of you know this by heart. We used to have a song, um, can, you know, made out of this song. So I'm going to give it here to you. Beloved, let us love one another. For love springs from God, and he who loves his fellow of human beings is begotten and born of God, it is coming progressively to know and understand God, to perceive and recognize and get a better, clearer knowledge of God. He who does not love has not become acquainted with God. He has never known him, for God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest. It was displayed where we are concerned in the fact that God sent his son, the only or the uniquely begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. This is the love we should be celebrating. This should be our focus. Our God is love. So why are we celebrating love in connection to a single person? Jesus was the perfect display of love. Putting our focus on romantic love, on loving other than our Christian love of one another, is putting a wrong focus. Do you know there are people all over the world that get depressed on Valentine's Day as a result of not having a romantic love in their life? We have gone wrong where Valentine's Day is concerned. We need to let go of it. 
We need to do instead as our Lord has commanded us. Let's look at that. John 13, 34 through 35. I give you a new commandment. This is our commandment from our Lord, that you should love one another just as I have loved you. So you too should love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another, if you keep on showing love among yourselves. There shouldn't be one day that is focused on on the love of romance, of what we receive from others, whether it's parents, what we receive from our kids, or kids, what we receive from our parents, or the romantic love in our life. This is gets it all skewed and messed up. We should love those around us each and every day. That is what the Lord wanted me to say. To let go of Valentine's Day. Love each other as he loved us. He loved us when we weren't perfect. He loved us when he didn't get it all right. He still loves us. That should be our focus on Valentine's Day. I hope you will spread the word. No more Valentine's Day. It's not about what that person can do and just get perfect for you and how much they can show you on one single day. Let's show our love for each other every day. Let's walk in kindness and patience and understanding. Let's even agree to disagree. If there is something that we don't agree on in scripture, the important thing is that we all have Jesus. We all know how much he loved us and we are all trying to learn about him and apply his ways to our life. Remember, Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey me. So we want to love Jesus, work at abide obeying him. We know it's a process. We know we may fail, we, but he will still love us. We'll try again. We keep trying until we get it right. This is the love of God, that we forgive one another, that we love one another, that we let go of differences, of of strife with one another. That is the only message I have today. We will add this to the other message, so there will be one very long living word. But know that God loves you. It's not about a day. It's not about a single day. We definitely should come apart from from celebrating a day dedicated to a human being. As our God is love. That is what's important. Until next week, may God bless you and may he keep you. May the Lord demonstrate and show his love forth in your life. May you feel his love. May he wrap his arms around you so you understand how much he loves you. Until next week. Shalom.